Casey, and I'm the founder of Nick Casey Footwear, which actually might end up just being Nick Casey because we're doing more than footwear now. <laughs> sure, uh, I actually have a, a bachelor, a bachelor's degree from uh, Pepperdine uh, with, um, let's see, I have two majors of so fine arts and advertising and a minor in international communications. In Malibu to starting my own company, I have done pretty much the entire like advertising cycle. So I started off as like an art director, graphic designer, and uh, then moved into media buying. Uh, and then I was a uh, QA analyst when the web first came out. So I was one of the first people to like work on websites and like find all the things that were wrong with it and what creates a better user experience. Uh, and then after that, I realized that all of those jobs um, I, I needed to do something that like really blended both like my, my sides of the brain and uh, allowed me to be creative and also organizational. So I ended up being a producer. So for about, I think nine years, no, maybe less than nine years, like six years, uh, at my ad agency, I was uh, a producer slash project manager, depending on different levels. Um, and I loved it because, you know, you get to work with a lot of different people. You get to be creative. Uh, and then after that, uh, I moved from my ad agency at, to Google because they were looking for someone to start their project management team in L.A. So I was there for three years and did that. And then I decided that it was time to take a risk while I could, you know, before I had like a family or, you know, someone else to, to be responsible for <laughs> and, uh, and start my own venture. Oh, yeah, so my preferred pronouns are they, them, there. And, uh, and I identify as um, gender non-binary, but also trans, trans-masculine, or masculine of center. Queer, I guess, would be the closest. Um, I guess, I think because I grew up in New York, my style is very kind of like, I don't know, black. <laughs> like, it's pretty much like black t-shirts you know jeans or a suit like I, i'm either you can either find me in a tux like you know uh or like casually I, i'm in jeans and a t-shirt pretty much like that's my uniform <laughs> so the reason i actually started my brand was because of my experience so my whole life since i was a kid i couldn't find shoes um that fit i guess my my inside <laughs> and like my outside and my inside never matched, you know, being born in the wrong body and like the feeling, knowing that I was in the wrong body, but never really being able to pinpoint what it was exactly. Cause I didn't understand, but I knew that whenever I saw guys shoes, I would be like, Oh, that's what I want to wear. And, um, and unfortunately I had very average female feet, so I could never find shoes in my size that I liked. And then whenever I, they would have, you know, uh, maybe a certain style that they would say, like they have it in the female sizes, I would like put it on and I would look down and just remember feeling like, this is not the same shoe. Like for whatever reason, their female version is always so much more feminized that proportionately it never looked right. When I looked down, I would just remember, I would look down and be like, I have like baby feet all of a sudden, you know? Um, and it was very um, embarrassing and humiliating, I think, so many times to walk into a store and be like, you know, I, I would like to try these shoes on. And they'd be like, go to the women's section. You know, even, even though, like, even when I was, like, a teenager to an adult presenting very masculine, still being directed to the women's section, like, that was very hard. And that, that's why I started my company. Well, I mean, since I was a kid, I had always told myself, like, damn it, like, I want to, one day I want to make these shoes because nobody's making them. Um, and, you know, it wasn't even just shoes as a child. It was, like, everything, right? Like, I found myself wearing, like, mostly, like, you know, sweatpants and sweatshirts because it was the only thing that was really gender neutral. And then, or, like, my mom would try to put me in dresses and I would have a, a fit. Um, and eventually when I started, you know, being able to, shop for myself and dress for myself, I, I found that it took me many years to really like, you know, figure out what that style was because it was a slow growth of like becoming more confident, you know, in my body and like, you know, basically reclaiming 
my my identity you know um so I think throughout my whole life I've always thought like what one day I'm gonna do this one day you know but I was such a workaholic that it was always about like you know paycheck to paycheck like you can't really like delve in to do these kind of things and still try to make a living so uh, right now I'm 42 so I left my job at Google in 2000, at the end of 2013. And uh, it took me pretty much, I mean, I got myself incorporated right away because I wanted to do everything right and by the book, you know. Um, but it took me like a whole year in 2014 to travel. I had um, transitional surgery. It took me time to heal. Then I spent nine weeks in uh, Europe. Uh, going to shoe fairs, you know, talking to people in the industry, trying to figure out, like, why doesn't this exist yet? You know, in, in 2014, why did this not exist? And then basically the response was like, yeah, we know there's this niche, but, like, it's just not worth it. And I think that was what fueled me because all of a sudden I was being told, like, we recognize that there's a need, but it's not worth it. Like, it you're telling me my whole community that I'm not worth it, that my people are not worth it, you know, like, so that, that was when I was really like, I'm really going to go and do this now. Like I, I will do whatever it takes now. Yeah. So it, it, it ranged from shoe designers to shoe manufacturers, you know, shoe brands. And, you know, when you, when you break it down and, you know, I've learned so much in the past three years, um, is when you break it down and all these large corporations that already make millions of dollars making shoes, it would cost them like nothing to branch out and like add a few more sizes or alter their designs a, l a little bit or create a separate collection, like literally probably pennies on the dollar, right? But they did not think that like their return would be worth it because they didn't see the market, they didn't understand the market was there yet. They just knew there was a niche market, right? They didn't realize how great this market was, how big. And so now we come to a time where it's becoming trendy, it's becoming hip, it's becoming newsworthy. And all of a sudden, they're scrounging. They're like, oh, there's this whole phenomenon, you know? And it's not even like, I don't think it starts off with like, oh, it's because we need to respect and like include these people that are human beings and part of the community. But it's like, oh, wow, this is hip, this is trendy, this is cool, this is a new thing. And we don't want, like, parents to be upset that we're not including their kids, so therefore, like, we should do this, right? And so it makes it very hard for companies like us, who basically have taken, you know, 20 years of our savings and quit our jobs and, that, and made so many sacrifices to do this because it costs me exponentially more to create one sample versus them, it would probably barely cost anything, right? And so the the worst part is now I'm in a, I'm not just me, but I think we as a community of entrepreneurs in our community, you know, we're in a place where now that we're starting to see this uh, wave that's coming and it could very easily push us out because we're competing, we're going to be competing with these billion dollar companies who see the dollar signs now. You know, but they're coming from a place of trying to make money, whereas we're coming from our experience, our history, our hearts, you know, our beliefs. So, yeah, sorry I went on a tangent, but that's the stuff that, like, I think gets me thinking <laughs> about whenever I start talking about my experience of, like, people in the industry. Sure. So right now, like, I've kept it very small. And by very small, I mean, it's just me. <laughs> And I, I'm basically like a one-man show, right? So, um, because it's different, it, I think it's a different type of, um, I don't want to say business plan because I don't even have a business plan, but like it's a different way of running the company because shoe design and shoe making takes so much longer than say like shirts and pants, and you know, like, so... So it's hard for me to get to the point where I can have a team because there are some times where I'm just waiting for samples to, to be made, you know, cut or stitched, you know. Um, and then we go through so many samples because I'm changing this concept of sizing. 
So shoe sizes have always been divided between men and women. So no matter if it looks gender neutral, if it, it says that, you know, it's gender neutral, they're still made from a woman's last or a men's last. And so what sets my company apart is because I, I think besides children's shoes, I'm the first company that has created a unisex sizing that literally does not differentiate and does not discriminate based on your gender or, or identity, right? So, so developing that whole series of sizing um, was very time consuming because I had to find really what I, I to me, you know, and it's a very subjective you know, concept, is like what to me is something that's gender equal and gender neutral. And then from there, um, you know, most companies, when they have like a certain sizing, it's like maybe like seven sizes, right? But mine's like 14 sizes because I have to include the entire range of what is considered female and male, right? And everything in between. Um, and to be inclusive, it's, it's very hard. So, so that makes everything take a little bit longer than normal. And then from there, the design aspect, you know, also takes a long time because, you know, I have to consider like, not only like all the shoes I wanted to wear that were like more masculine, but like also what I think I want to create for everybody, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite and like not be able to create stuff for other people too, that might not necessarily want to wear masculine shoes. So that's why I started with my gender neutral collection because I want people to be like, literally look at my designs and not think male or female or anything, except that it's a good design or it's not, whether they like it or not, you know, whether it fits their style or not. So my typical day is, it involves like every aspect of this development to execution to like getting all the resources all you know whether it's Portugal or Mexico you know to understand like what I'm trying to do um, reviewing samples and I travel a lot to these places to to work with them um, you know I also work with a lot of nonprofit organizations to you know uh, help you know create more exposure visibility I donate shoes to them, um, whether it's like the youth or the senior citizens who have been underrepresented or don't have access. Um, and, and I'm just really, so what was that? Oh yeah, so I tried to have an intern, but um, it's, it's hard to find people who have the time and also like passion for this. All right, yeah. yeah. The last is, let me show you. is this yeah so there's a saying in the shoe industry is that you start with the last first because if you have a really great last then you can make amazing shoes because it should fit and like i always tell people like i tell my customers that when they wear my shoes it should feel like someone's taking a pair of hands and hugging their feet you know and that's the way it should feel so we're only online because uh I would love someday to have like a brick and mortar. Um, the next step actually is to start reaching out to boutiques that um, are like in line with, I think, our vision. But it's very hard because, you know, being at the forefront of a movement means that not most people aren't going to quite get you yet, you know. And like I've talked to buyers at Nordstrom and Barney's and and they, you know, the response I got was like, oh, you know, we, we already have shoes like that. Like, we have Fry's and Doc Martens. And I'm like, wow, you totally just missed ex what I'm doing, you know? So, so I try not to, so far I've tried not to push because I realize that they're just not ready yet. And, and I don't want to create um, an abrasive relationship, right? I'd rather just have them kind of like recognize I exist. Maybe they don't think they're ready for me yet, or they don't even know what I am yet. But like, I think once, once it catches on, I'm hoping that they're, eventually they're going to be calling me to be like, hey, <laughs> you know, we need you now because now we understand, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Sure. So right now we started off with shoes because that's, you know, something that I recognize that nobody else was doing. And it's my passion. Like I love shoes and 
And I think shoes are really like, to me, not a necessary. Shoes, I think, is what makes your outfit, you know, because if you can have the most gorgeous outfit, but if you don't have any shoes to go with it, you know, you kind of, it's still a missing piece. So shoes to me are very, very important. Um, but I also realized that, you know, I, the price point for my shoes are a little bit higher than probably the average person's shoes because, uh, number one, they're incredibly great quality. You know, they're all hand stitched and like high craftsmanship. Um, really great leathers uh, made in Portugal or, or, or Mexico. Um, the ones in Mexico are Goodyear Welt, which, you know, are, are the creme de la creme of stitching for shoes, right? Um, uh, so, so like I said, like for me, having such a small production and because I'm a no name brand, it costs me so much money to create. So I have to pass that obviously to my, my customers, but my, my goal is that eventually if enough people were buying it on a regular basis and my production, you know, grows bigger and bigger then price points will drop and thereby making them more accessible to other people and all people. Right. So that's my long-term goal is to be able to create a regular production on a constant basis where I can continue to have like my high end line, but then be able to afford to also do maybe like a medium or a lower end line for, you know, people who are not as privileged to afford like $300 shoes. Right. And I think the reality is that for the LGBTQ community, particularly the trans community is we make the, the least amount of money out of the entire hierarchy, right? The food chain. And, uh, and so it's been kind of torturous, I think, for my heart because I'm making these shoes because of my community, because of how I identify, but then at the same time, knowing that like most of us can't afford it, you know, I might, I can't even afford it, right? But I know that it takes time, but I'm hoping that people who can afford it will support it to help us grow to the point that we become a regular thing, right? Uh, as far as other products, I've started to make uh, a unisex utility holster. And I don't know if you've seen those, like, but they're like, yeah. And, uh, and you know, for me, it's about like, it's not about supporting violence because people are always like, oh, it's like a gun holster. And to me, it's like, no, it's like a love holster. <laughs> you know, like you get to, it's the first holster that's made that I've ever seen that is completely adjustable to fit all body types. You know, because most of them that I've seen, because I, you know, I try to find one for myself is they're either very, you know, made, designed big for men or like they're very like lacy and <laughs> ornate for women and I just don't see the need why it has to be one or the other so so I, de I design stuff that's very in the middle for everybody yeah so for me you know I my signature look is always with the holster I've been wearing it for a long time uh and it's just like my wallet my business cards I have a little mini flashlight in there you know for emergencies um I can put my phone if I wanted to you know the one I designed is adjustable and versatile in the sense of you could add on a second wallet on the other side so you can put other things you can I have little loops so that you could have like keychains on there I mean there's just so many things I want it means a utility holster for a reason because it's supposed to be you know for using so because if you just look at it without seeing me wearing it a lot of people like even the the factory that help, helps me make it was like has has had such a hard time with it because they couldn't grasp the design you know so i had to like literally fly there and show them like this is what you do yeah so i mean right now i call it like a footwear and accessories company a gender equal you know footwear and accessories company because i think accessories is a general term enough uh but like i want to make things that are like utilitarian like that you know solve problems for everyday lives or, or makes your life easier and also makes you feel represented. And so it's coming up with things that I think can, can provide those things. And so it's hard to say like, oh, I want to make like, you know, bracelets, you know, like I have a, I have a leather bracelet cuff, but that ne doesn't necessarily fit into that, um, 
passion that I have. It was just me, more of like the design uh, shows an equal sign when you wear it. So like it's about promoting equality. So I, a lot of things I design is multi-layered in that way where it's like representative of the positive impact you want to make in society. It's about kind of like a, a secret nudge to one another. Like when you see it, like I know you support equality, like yeah, we're, I'm, me too, you know? Um, but then also like being able to provide people with like, wow, like I, I have so many customers who are like, you know, I've waited my whole life for shoes like this, or I've waited my whole life, you know, to be, to feel authentic wearing something like this. So, so I think, you know, other things I want to create are, are going to be in line with that. Like, and I can't say specifically yet, like what that is, you know? Yeah, maybe like I thought about clothing that was on the top of my list, but it's also hard because there's so, I think there's an influx of people creating gender neutral clothing and, and I kind of, I have so much respect for them that I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to compete, you know, like, so part of me kind of feels like, well, maybe I should just stick to the stuff that I'm doing. That's not competing with anybody, you know, if other people want to com compete or come into the market, that's great because I think that's healthy. I think we need it. I want everybody to be making stuff for us, you know, because that's the only way that it's going to be so visible and so normal, you know? Um, but I don't know. It's hard. it's hard for me. It's like I'm constantly like torn between like, do I want to make like a jacket, you know, or a suit, <laughs> you know, because those are the things I love. But but I'm like, oh, but then you know, so and so are making these already, and I don't want to compete with them. <laughs> yeah. Actually, had reached out to me before they did their Kickstarter campaign. Was, um, I don't know if they had talked to Karen Finch, but they talked to somebody that knew me. And because after my Kickstarter campaign, I tried to help pay it forward and like help a lot of other Kickstarter campaigns, especially in our queer community, you know, and it's all about being a community and like teaching them like, this is my experience. These are my learnings, right? So, so they reached out to me and, uh, and told me what they were doing. And I was just like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Like, how can I help you? So I spent like, you know, a few hours talking to them and like really giving them a lot of insight that I had. And, and I tried to even offer like, hey, like if you're making your shoes in Portugal and I'm making my shoes in Portugal, maybe we can combine efforts and like get one factory to do it for us because that actually gives us more leverage. But they weren't, they weren't into it, so. <laughs> so I left it at that. <laughs> so I think because I'm still so much in the beginning stages of my development as a designer, like I didn't come from fashion design at all. And certainly I had no idea how to design shoes, but I knew what I liked. And I'm the kind of person that is extremely OCD and, and detailed. So like I knew all the things I loved in a shoe and all the things I didn't like in a shoe. And so when I designed, I literally just, I was in Portugal, I rented an apartment, I just sat down and I just kind of, I don't know, just kind of like let my mind go go nuts and, and thought about all the shoes I've ever wanted, you know, monk boots, uh, derbies or oxfords and, you know, all the very classic designs. And, and the thing with classic designs is like my, if you know my style, you'll know that my style is very classic and simple and comfortable. Right. So, so it's really like, um, you can't, it's like, you can't perfect the wheel, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so classic is classic in a way that you can't do too much to it. But the way I looked at it was like, what I'm doing is about modernizing society to catch up with the evolution of how human beings are, right? The fact that like, that we need to be more inclusive, that we need to embrace everybody's, you know, rainbow colors, right? And, uh, and so that's what I did, I think, with these classic designs was like, okay, now, I'm going to keep them classic, you know, a monk boot is going to be a monk boot, but I can, you know, improve upon the proportion to make it inclusive. I can expand the sizing to make them in inclusive. I can add, like, accent colors or, like, sing signature looks, you know, like adding the equal sign emblem on all of my products to modernize it in that way where I can utilize fashion as activism.
you know and that's that's to me like my way of designing you know um i would love to eventually i think as i learn and grow as a designer you know go crazy and really come up with something that's like you know off the wall you know but but i guess for me right now it's like there's only so much the first that you can do right like if i'm already the first to create a unisex size i don't want to also be like here's this crazy design to go with it you know i feel like it would be very hard for people to digest so so i think i wanted to kind of like you know it's like the story between the turtle and the rabbit right like i'd rather just go slowly and like allow people the opportunity to evolve with me versus like forcing it down their throats the newest design in the second collection called destiny well the collection is called destiny because the first collection was called fortune and the reason it was called fortune was because i really you know i was inspired by the color red and in, in chinese culture that's the color of fortune right it brings you good fortune good luck and i thought in starting my brand i wanted i wanted the idea of you know good fortune to be brought to all the people who want to support this concept of equality right so so the second collection the reason it's called destiny was because it's the first collection that's going to be not only gender equal but also gender neutral and that is ultimately like my destiny to do that. So, so when you look at this, this design right here, um, it's got dual zippers on both sides. It's got the, the equal sign emblem. And the zipper is actually dual, like dual tone, two tone. So that uh, it's actually this specific YKK zipper is only available in Mexico. So, um, so that, that's the attention to detail that I have is like every little thing, you know, even from, from the, the pull tab, you know. Um, this was inspired by uh, George Michael actually. <laughs> so I'm a huge George Michael fan. And so this, this design is called the Georgios, which is his first name. And um, and I guess uh, the reason he inspired me to do this design is like when when you think about him in the faith uh, video, he has boots that are cowboy boots, right? And and I think cowboy boots are something that's so masculine. Like in American culture, cowboys like that's the ultimate masculinity, right? But then at the same time, I think George was like so. I think he he like he just always growing up for me like he he was like this vision for me that was both so beautiful and so masculine you know what I mean like and I knew like I loved him because his music was so soulful his look was so like he was masculine but there was something about him I don't know if it was my gaydar I don't know what it was but I knew that there's something about him that just encompassed like everything that I love about human beings it's like this blend of like masculinity and femininity so so i knew that i wanted to make a shoe like this because i've always wanted to wear one but it's even though inspired by the cowboy boot it's also inspired by flamenco dancer boots so i was i'm a huge fan of like watching flamenco dancers and i love the males uh the men dancers boots and they have like the the heel that's like this you know like tapered and, and higher and so it reminds me very much of like a cowboy boot and the flamenco dancer boot put together is like what i came up with is this and uh and i really like think that this is a boot where you can look at it and think it's neither masculine nor feminine yet all of it at the same time right and so wherever i go i've had the most masculine men like cisgendered men be like where'd you get those? And I'd be like, oh, I designed it, you know? And they're like, wow, I want to wear it. And I was like, okay, you gotta wait, you gotta wait, you know? And then I also have like, you know, super feminine girls, you know, telling me they love it, like, and everybody in between, you know? And, and that's, a, that's the, I think that's the part that makes what I do worthwhile is like moments like that where I'm like, I got to fulfill my dream of creating something like this where it kind of blows people's minds when they're like, oh, like, 
that's neither a men's shoe or a women's shoe and that everybody can wear it. Um, I think the more people I can get to look at my designs and say they want to wear it and then learn later that it, you know, they're opposite gendered or somebody totally different than them could be also wearing it. I think that's where they're going to learn to expand their minds because no one's telling them like you have to wear this or that, you know, because of how you identify, you have to wear this. Right. I think that's how I want to change the world is literally getting them to change it themselves by being exposed to things that normally wouldn't be the way it is. So. But like even here, like the bottom, I say break the binary. I don't know if you can see that. So it's like, yeah, details like that. And the red stitching on the side of the welt. Yeah. <laughs> Design of my brand that everybody loves is the monk boot. I guess I should show you a non-black color because I feel like I'm showing a lot of black color. Hold on, let me find another color. But here's the monk boot, but in a different color. So this was like one of the first designs I came up with um, for the fortune collection. So uh, this was a very, very popular shoe. Everybody loved this one because it's different. You know, um, it's again, you know, got the equal sign, red stitching, my logo. Uh, even the bottom stitching is red. So, you know, that that's, that's what it was all about, like that red that I wanted everyone to, to kind of um, key into that, you know, like let's, let's all live in good fortune together, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean like success, power, or money. It's like good fortune that like we all can live in harmony and peace, you know, and joy uh, and live authentically together. Um, so, but yeah, the monk boot. This design, you know, like I mentioned, is that the monk boot is something that's so classic that's been around for a very long time. You know, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel, but using like accent colors and like contrast, um, you know, adding a toe cap, like things like that, that really, I think, help bring out the look. And, and I think what a lot of my clients really loved about it is that it's a shoe that really conveys like masculinity but it fits you know all of us in a different way than a traditional men's shoe would so so i think that was the first phase of the company is like getting you know maybe female bodied people or trans people to be able to you know find out that there's somebody that's representing them and, and thinking about them when designing and then it kind of just like branched out and caught on to to the rest of the community and and, and the goal is that you know eventually we're going to reach mainstream so uh so the stitching color is going to change and my goal is like my plan has always been that it was going to be like seasonal but i think because i feel like i've been in the season of development and growth and i feel like that I'm not done with that yet. Like I'm not ready to get to that next phase for that next mood, I guess, because it's all so inspired by my mood and my, like my inspiration obviously is my life and what's in my surroundings and, and my experience. So I feel like I'm not ready to let go of that red yet because I, I'm still, I need everyone to get to that point of like being fortunate together, you know? So I think at some point, I'll be ready to be inspired to use a different color. And I already have an idea of what that is, but that will affect, you know, the stitching is, is so important. So changing that color is going to affect really all the other colors of the leathers that I'm going to use. So I have to be really ready for that when that time comes. Yeah, definitely, you know, I follow like footwear news and, and a lot of like footwear, you know, uh, publications. And obviously, fashion magazines and shows um what are celebrities wearing uh, what are trendsetters wearing i try not to let it influence me too much because we're on different planes you know like i'm in the uh plane of like creating a new movement where 
people have weren't even able to wear the original old style so you know like i'm not interested in like creating stuff that's like oh this is the latest trend so therefore i must create something just like that and like no you know what i like to do when i see it is like oh like this is cool or i'll find aspects of it that i think are inspiring and uh more than anything else i think is when you use materials that are not maybe available yet or that, that i have i don't know about that's where i get to learn a lot more like oh my god that's made with mushroom leather okay where do i get that you know because i really want to create stuff in a more sustainable non-animal based material but that's not like chemical ridden you know and made it with plastic you know so it's 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 a lot of challenges yes and no like i feel like there definitely are ones where i i am more fond of in terms of styles and um but i i wouldn't like I wouldn't say like they're the only like ins inspirations, you know what I mean? Like because there's always stars I'm not familiar with that I'm like, oh wow, like that's that's amazing, you know. Let's see. I would say that the core customer base uh is uh majority female actually. Um and maybe majority also LGBT. And they're, I think, more fashion conscious. Uh, but maybe, I would say maybe like 60% would be more masculine presenting. Uh, but that's about to change, obviously, with a new collection. Um, you know, there, there are fans that can't wait for like the high heels to come out because they're, they're just dying to support the cause. You know, it's not even so much about the design sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're from all over the world. The majority of them are in the U.S., but I have, like, customers in New Zealand, in South Africa, London, you know, Singapore. Um, so it's really cool, like, when people learn about what I'm doing and the fact that they're so passionate about it. Like, they're fans for life. So, yeah. So the one you just saw with um, the Georgios, George Michael one that's only the beginning of my second collection so I've been in development for a long time because I'm such a perfectionist I've had really tough issues with the materials like so the leather that I wanted I wanted to create a certain look with that shine but when you have that kind of shine and you have a one piece of leather so here's a little leather education is this particular design from here all the way to the other side of here is one piece of leather, right? So most shoes, if you pay attention, they have a lot more pieces because one is cheaper to cut more pieces. And two, because in order to get one piece of leather into this form, it requires using heat and using, you know, the last and like really molding it into this shape. So it costs a lot more money and process to do it. So if you have a piece of leather that has shine, that means there's been some sort of coating, right? And when you have coating and then you add heat, it changes the leather because leather is organic, right? So it stretches, it you know expands, it contracts. So I had so many problems developing this, this design. And I could have made it easier by just adding like a stitch somewhere so that it becomes two pieces. But because I'm not willing to sacrifice the design, I spent a lot of time finding the right leather. So I had leather imported from Europe. I've tried so many tanneries. Like, I've gone through so many samples. I think this was, like, maybe the 12th sample of this shoe. Like, it's crazy. I think my factory was, like, ready to like, kill me. Um, but I'm very lucky that, you know, he and I have built a, a wonderful friendship. And he gets my perfectionism. And the idea is that when we finally find it and we finally produce it, people are going to love it because they're going to see the kind of detail and the kind of passion that we have, you know. Um, but man, like, it's so hard. Like, but I think I understand now. You know, a lot of it, too, is because 
I'm new to all of this. Like, I didn't know that, like, if I go shiny, I should go with smaller piece, you know, <laughs> like, but now I know. So the next time I design, I'm going to know right away, you're not, you're going to have to give up the shine, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. But I forget, what was the question? <laughs> so I'm releasing the second collection right now. We're going to have uh, five designs. So two are going to be shoes. Like, the two shoes I'm really proud of because that's when I started to, like, design based off of, like, stuff I've never seen before, you know? So I'm excited to see what it looks like. But I'm also frightened because, again, as a new shoe designer, it could look really horrible. <laughs> you know, for all I know, it's going to come out and it's going to be like, oh, my God, but why did I do this? Uh, or it's going to come out and be like, no one's ever done this before and it looks awesome. You know, so. Uh, and some of these designs were inspired by, like, clients of mine who have become lifelong friends now because of our love of, of you know, shoes and of, of the, the mission. Uh, and particularly one client, Mindy, uh, she's become like this fashionista icon, I think, in the queer community because her style is so unique and so just colorful. And it's like complete opposite of me. You know, I'm always in black and like she's always in color, but she inspires me so much with her style that I actually designed you based off kind of her influence. So I'm excited for that. It's actually easier to find me because I'm the like the only one really doing what I'm doing, and uh, and so I always recommend the people on your list. So that's why I was like, well, this is new, like you know, they're already on here. Okay, well, I won't need to recommend them anymore this time. <laughs> so, but it's awesome. Like I'm 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 happy that you know you found us. If you like, if there's like retailers or like big brands or you know, stores that are looking for brands like us because we are this new movement. Like I actually was talking to Vicky uh, last year about trying to propose, like have a proposal for, for like big department stores or big brands um, of retailers to basically, you know, be at the forefront of creating departments for them that are focused on what we're doing so that like Nordstrom could be the first retail department store to have like this gender neutral department of yeah. all the gender neutral brands because we're in contact with one another like all of us in the community right yeah. um but we kind of we kind of fell on the side because you know we got so busy right. um but we all go on these like fashion show circuits right so so we all know each other. We all try to work together and collaborate on things um, and just help help one another. But I feel like that's that's what's like really missing is that nobody, you know, the big brands like they either like Zara, you know, like you said, Gap, like either they just want to start creating stuff on their own, but it's like so, it's so off the stuff they create because they're not us. Right. So so they just create things they think is what we want, but it's so off. Like like when Zara came out with their gender neutral collection, it was like gray sweatsuits. And and I remember looking at it and just being like, wow, like that's what you think gender neutral is. Like just subtract all the fashion and create sweatsuits that are gray. Like, I'm sorry, but sweatpants have always been gender neutral <laughs> like i don't know why you think it's like now it's a new thing <laughs> um but anyways yeah because it's gonna happen eventually it's just a matter of time yeah. and i'm just curious like yeah. who that who who are those first few people that are gonna be like we need this yeah so i don't know if you remember like selfridges in in london was like the first largest oldest department store to have you know, they, they did an uh, experiment basically where like they had a whole floor that was just non-gendered, right? Um, and got rid of like the women's department and the men's department. And I thought to myself like, that's amazing. Like the oldest original department store ever taking that step, you know? And, and yet I'm like still waiting for all the other more modern, you know, ones to like catch on like hello you know 
But it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of time. Um, that I haven't quit yet? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm most, I mean, at the end of the day, I think, um, I have to think, I remember I go back to what my mom told me. And you know, my mom and I have become very close as I have become older, I guess. Um, and when I first started this company, uh, she was very supportive, although she was very worried because she was, you know, everybody thought I was nuts quitting my job at Google to do this. Um, but she was very supportive and she even modeled for me at my first fashion show in New York. Uh, and it was, um, it was, what is it, Rainbow Fashion Week. And so she modeled the runway for me in my, in my monk boots that you saw. Um, but she told me at one point that she was like, you know, she was like, in Chinese, obviously, uh, she was like, so I was like, you're so brave, so courageous. And then she said, like, you're not afraid to take risks. And when you set your mind and you say you're going to do something, you always do it. You know, you always make it happen, no matter how hard it is. And I think that's what I'm most proud of when I think about, like, what, because there's so many things, like, we can be proud of, right? I mean, there are so many hurdles that you overcome that you, you're proud of all of those moments. And all of those moments combined together, you know, get you to your present, right? But when I think of, like, what is the most monumental thing that I can say that I do is that like what I said that I was going to quit my job and start the shoe company even with like zero experience like I did it you know and and I didn't do it alone you know like I had this amazing support from my community like the, my community here in LA around the world like people who didn't know me who now are my friends like somehow believed in something like they believed in why I was doing what I was doing and I think at the end of the day you know Mindy told me she's like you know it's about your authenticity and like you're so genuine that people want to invest in your story and and that's something to be proud of you know that not everybody can be so transparent and be so open about their journey and to me it's like i'm making shoes like it's a journey it's about the journey you know you gotta you gotta walk with me right like we gotta walk together on this so um so yeah i'm proud of that so many <laughs> um i think i didn't expect it to be i didn't expect it to be easy that's for sure um, but I didn't expect it to be so tremendously hard. Um, and, and I think one year into it, I was, um, I think I was at a trade show for shoes with somebody I met along the way that, you know, heard my story and wanted to help me. And, uh, and he said to me, cause he had been in the industry for like over 35 years. And he said to me, he was like, you literally picked the m hardest industry to go into, you know, like shoes are the worst industry to go into. And I was like, come on, like, it's just another, you know, product. And he's like, no, it literally is the hardest industry to go into. And, uh, and now after like two years, I'm like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I finally get it now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I grew up like, you know, my aunt has like a, a clothing factory. Like I grew up watching, you know, uh, that, that part of the world, you know, kind of behind the scenes of how clothing become reality. And it never seemed like so hard to me. Like I would be in the factory, like clipping like little, you know, threads and stuff and, and it just seemed like very, like, okay, like it's hard work, but it's doable. But shoes are like, people don't realize, for example, you know, well, this is not a good example, but let's say this is a, a boot with lots of shoelaces, right? And you look at the shoes and you think, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, this is a great design. Like, oh, it's so easy to make you stitch this together and whatever. But nobody thinks about like, there's a resource to make the buckle. 
there's a resource to make the leathers for this heel and then the rubber injection and like every single part of this even the guy who who stitches the equal sign is a whole different resource you know because it's all about if you want quality you want to have experts that do each part of those things do those part right like you don't want me to make your shoes but <laughs> like they'll last you like a day right so so i think those are things that people don't think about like it, the eyelets the shoelace like somebody is making each one of those items to make a whole shoe and 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 that, those are things i took for granted like i didn't know i just thought like oh shoe factory one guy makes all of this you know and then when there's delays when there's problems like for everything that i want to change i'm not changing it with one person i have to change it for everybody right so so yeah that was i think the thing that really blew my mind you know and even like the last the person who makes this <laughs> like the expert who's been doing this for 35 years that like i have to literally argue to death with them because they're like this is your last is wrong you know it's a woman's last or it's a men's last and i'm like no it's a it's a unisex last and you, you've never made it before because it didn't exist before like every single part of what i do was literally like having to argue my way into it and getting them to understand why i was doing it how i was doing it and uh even the last guy like when he finally finished the design after all of my changes i had to ask him i was like okay now tell me the truth what do you think do you think this is a nice last and he was like yeah it's nice you know and like those are moments that i feel you know like because he's the expert like he's gonna tell me because he's been doing this for 35 years or 40 years or however long but at the same time all of these people who are such craftsmen in what they do they're also still thinking about what it was like 30 years ago when they were doing it right so so it's very hard like it's a very archaic industry it's a very old old school industry but that's also why they're so good because they've been doing it for so long but to, to be able to change their minds and get them to understand where I'm coming from and not only do what I say, but enjoy what they're doing for me because they're doing something different. You know, I don't want them to like begrudgingly like, oh, okay, you said this, so I'd do it, you know? Because then I don't, I don't want anyone to work, work with me if they're not going to enjoy it, right? So, but to see like their eyes light up when they finally like grasp what I'm doing, that is amazing. Um, I would say the majority of it is like, and if you ever need testimonials, you can go on my website. I have like testimonials for every product. Um, but yeah, I think the majority of it, it really is, um, you know, how they're very comfortable or like they finally fit them properly because, you know, you got to think about like for me, I spent my whole life wearing shoes that were too big. And so I would like put two insoles, I would wear super thick socks or double the socks just so I could like fit into a pair of shoes that fit my exterior, right? Um, but now to have something where, I remember the first time I put on my own design and I, I was in Europe, I was in Portugal and I put on my design for the first time and I remember the joy of having it just fit me, you know, without, extra insoles without anything like like I just started tearing and like walking so proudly on the streets even though they were cobblestones and it was the first sample so they hurt like hell you know because they weren't perfected you know we we're still figuring out the nuances but at least it fit you know and it was my design and it was so amazing and and I think that's you know, whenever I get an email or a, a social media post from my clients, it's that same, I, I understand. I understand what they're trying to say because I've been there. Like, I experienced it. And it's this joy, like, you know, like, one one client was like, you know, for the first time they felt like they didn't have children's feet because they were finally wearing shoes that look proportionally to their body. Or, like, somebody else was like, um, uh, what was it like? Uh, they felt they walked differently, you know, like they felt like they walked proudly and like 
with confidence, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the stuff about like, oh, being comfortable or like, oh, they look super cool or great quality, those are all great. And, and I'm super happy to receive that kind of feedback. But it's the stuff that really, that is so powerful that impacts the way they see themselves. That's the stuff that I really love to, to hear. Um, I think most of the negative feedback is just the price point, you know, um, and, and I get it, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where if I could help it, I would, <laughs> you know, so, uh, when I first started, I was using like my own savings, um, to, you know, fund like the research and development. And then once I had the, the first samples of like the first few designs, that's when I started a Kickstarter campaign. And, uh, and I think I raised over my goal of 35,000, I think. So I think my total was like 40 something thousand that I, I, I got. Uh, and then I took that money and I went into production and paid for the rest of the samples and you know, finalizing everything. Uh, shipping if all of those it's very expensive when you're importing um, and uh, and then whatever was left over I utilized to help develop you know the rent the new stuff so but after that was gone <laughs> uh, it's now basically my savings yeah um, so when I first started um, with the research part uh, I went to like the shoe fairs, you know, and, and met shoemakers from literally around the world. Um, and when you go to like stuff like magic in, in, the, in the States, uh, most of the people that come are like from Asia. Like there's not as many European manufacturers that come. Uh, they mostly go to the ones in Europe, right? So, so I had to go to the ones in Europe. And, and honestly, if I met... If there was like, let's say just a, a rough number, like a thousand manufacturers from around the world at this trade show, um, I would talk to or try to talk to maybe 80% of that, right? And out of the 80% of that, maybe 10% of those people would even comprehend what I'm talking about, you know? And out of that 80%, not even to the 10% yet, maybe only 50% of the people would even bother to talk to me because I'm nobody, right? So it's a very old industry where everybody has been in the industry for many, many years. So they all know one. So like it's, it's a, uh, a very old industry where everyone, at, like I was so surprised like everybody knew everybody, right? So, so I come along and nobody would talk to me because they were like, we don't know you. And understandably like, I found out later is because a lot of people, number one, I'm Asian. So they thought I was like trying to like go and like steal ideas. And then two is I wasn't represented by like an agent or anyone that knew them. So it was very hard for them to want to communicate with me, right? So let's say after the 50% that would talk to me, then 10% of that actually understood what I was going for. Otherwise, they just thought, like, you want to make men's shoes and women's sizes. And I'm like, no, that's not what I want. Um, so, and even within that percentage was, like, you know, how many were homophobic? How many were male chauvinistic? How many were transphobic? Like, there were so many things that really limited the, the amount of people that I could actually like, work with. So, luckily, you know, I did end up leaving meeting a few people, you know, thanks to the grace of people paying it forward, I met this amazing agent from Italy, Giovanni, and he was amazing. He taught me so much. He introduced me to all these people. And, uh, and, and that's the only reason I think I was able to like talk to as many people as I, I did. And, um, and he helped me get, you know, let's see, I had, when I was in Italy, I had two factories that he highly recommended that understood what I was saying, uh, make samples for me. And then I had samples made in Portugal. Uh, then I had samples made in Spain. And out of all of those samples, 
it just ended up that you know choosing choosing Portugal was because one the quality was amazing like in fact to the samples that I received I found better were better than the ones from Italy so that was one right and so quality obviously is huge Secondly, when I was in Italy, unfortunately, my experience was that, and this is not to all factories because I can't speak for all of them, but the ones I went to, um, their standards of like, yeah, environmental standards maybe, like I, there was none. Like there was no venting, there was no fans, like there was no protection of any kind. I walked in, I could barely breathe, you know, because of the fumes. Um, so those are things that are, I know, important not only to me, but for my customers. And in the States, those are things that we care about. You know, we want to be environmentally friendly. We want to do things properly for people's, you know, employees' health, uh, health standards. Um, so, so that was another thing. And then thirdly was they were just so damn male chauvinistic to me. Like, like I just knew nothing. Like, to them, they were just like, you know nothing. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, and I'm just standing there like, okay, if you, if you think so, but just so you know, I'm the one paying you to do this for me. So I know something, right? Um, it was very interesting. It was just, uh, such a different culture. Um, and it didn't matter that like I was trans, it didn't matter that I was masculine presenting, like they would just still think of me as a woman and that I didn't know anything. Uh, and so that was hard for me. Um, and then, you know, I got to Portugal and the Portuguese are just so lovely and so kind. I was so lost and, and you know, most people would just be like, you know, go that way, right? Like this gentleman literally stopped what he was doing and walked me all the way to where I was going and went back the other way. And I just, like, that That really made such a huge impact on my outlook of this culture, you know, and their economy was, you know, doing, well, all of Europe was actually doing really badly at the time. And, uh, and I just thought, like, if I'm going to, you know, support any economy, I'm going to support these people because they showed me the kindness that all of us should show to each other, you know, um, so you know, it, it, it was just icing on the cake that the, the quality of the shoes was more to my liking. Yeah. As far as Mexico is because, uh, you know, I still have had problems with Portugal. There's no, you know, nothing's perfect. And it's so far, so it costs so much and it takes so long. So that's why I'm giving Mexico a shot to see how that progresses. And also because I want to do Goodyear Wealth and to do Goodyear Wealth in Europe is like three times more. So for example, this is the first collection and this is Blake Stitch. So what Blake Stitch is like, it goes this way. So it just, you know, goes around and they just stitch in here, right? Um, and this is like an open channel, which means you can see the channel. For a Goodyear welt, which is this one, you can't see it because I did a closed channel so it's closed up. But a Goodyear welt is a specific type of machine that I think Goodyear invented. And it stitches in a very different way. And some people, you know, I think there's debates on like, if there's one that's better, everyone thinks Goodyear welt is the best. And I'm not gonna, I'm not, I don't think I'm knowledgeable enough to refute that. But some other shoemakers think they're both equally durable. You know, but I just like, I liked the Goodyear Elf for, because for this design, I can do a closed channel and not do the, you know, you can't see the stitching. And so in that sense, I think it could be like an additional layer of durability because now you don't have an open channel. So like water can't seep through or, you know, less things open to the elements. Um, but both of these types of stitching are great for shoes and why they last so long is because you can literally take out when this wears out, you can just stitch on a new one, you know, so you don't have to just like, you know, do the glue type, which is what most shoes are these days. So, so they just last for a really long time. And when you, when you change the soles of shoes, 
this is all stuff I have learned that I'm super excited to share is that most people don't realize like when you get your shoes resold, whenever you open up the bottom of your shoe, you lose your shape of your shoe. Because if you no, you don't have to last, right? Like you don't have this to go with this when you when you fix your shoe. So you always lose some of this shape. But I guess with a good year welt, it's um somehow I still I'm still not sure like what it is exactly, but but apparently it is a much better way to change the sole that like keeps the shape of your shoe better. So that's what they tell me. <laughs> so one of my um core missions for for I mean not even just my brand but personally always is I've always been a huge supporter of all, most of the LGBTQ nonprofits so like for example in LA is like the LA LGBT Center um, then there's HRC there's um, the Trans Latina Coalition there's uh, Lambda Legal you know and there's so many great organizations that do so much for our community um, and so when I started the company, I wanted to translate that also to like, okay, you know, even for my Kickstarter, that was part of the Kickstarter campaign too, is like for every like 50 pairs of shoes that I was able to back, I would donate one pair to the youth center, you know? Um, so it was, uh, it was something from the very beginning that was very much part of like the vernacular of like what I want my mission to be. And so even though like I'm only what two and a half years old as a company and barely sustaining you know I still donate a huge chunk to all of these organizations because again it's what it's all about like you can always make more money later you know but to be able to continuously like support them to help them keep doing what they're doing is what it's all about. No, I guess, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, like, the, the summary, I guess, would be just, like, for me, <laughs> um, like, we're not here for ourselves as businesses, you know, like, we're here for literally, like, a movement of changing, creating social impact, you know, um, so, Hopefully that's what it will do. <laughs> so, I mean, for it, it was um, something that I had to be very um, uh, purposeful about because, you know, in creating a brand that is about being for everyone, number one, it's hard to include everyone, like, because everyone is so subjective, right? Um, but I did keep in mind, like, you know, being body uh, positive, um, being inclusive. So, you know, my models include trans, trans people, uh, cis people, queer people, straight people, everyone. Like, my Kickstarter campaign, I had a photo shoot that was literally, I just reached out to the entire community. And I was like, whether you're straight, gay, male, female, whatever you are, this is what I'm doing. And if you believe in supporting this, then come, you know? And so we just ended up having a big party with a big photo shoot and everybody volunteered and it was amazing, you know? And, and I made cocktails and I brought food and, and it was, it made it about, like, it wasn't just like my brand, like hiring you, you know? It was about like, we're coming together as a community and we're going to do this together, you know? And I, I think I've kept that, that mentality like since then and and now even when i do the photo shoots that look amazing and they look so professional um and they are i mean they're they're professionals because my friends who donate their time they're professionals right but it's still about that community it's still about like they believe in being a part of it because they believe in the mission of the brand you know and and even though I, I hate the fact that I can't afford to like pay everybody what they're worth, but I, you know, I try my best to like pay what I can or trade and what I can and, and keep it authentic. It is important. It's mm -hmm. about the image of their brand and what they're about, you know, and because my brand is about authenticity. Like even 
you know, so, so everyone is like, it's real people, you know? So like even the photo where it looks like it's a couple, like they're a real couple, you know? Like, 